Well, once again, we have the privilege of studying God's Word, and so I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, the last two times together, we talked about how to desire God's Word because we were pulling back from chapter 3 and what we've been looking at on the carnal Christian, and we were seeing that while they were being carnal, they certainly were not desiring the things of God like they should, and they certainly were having a hard time to receive any of the meat of the word as even as well as the milk of the word as Paul says in chapter 3 and verse 1. But now we're going to move over to verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 10, and we're going to carry from verse 10 down to verse 17. And what I was going to say with verse 5, in verses 5 through 9, that's where we heard Paul using agricultural terminology. Remember he said, I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So he used these agricultural terms. Now he's going to use another uh, illustration by using architectural terms, where he talks about planning and building and foundations and so forth. But all of this to illustrate his point of not elevating one another. And uh, that certainly was the problem that was causing contentions in the fellowship. So, but as we look at this this morning, we're going to see that the entire passage is talking about the judgment of believers' works. Anytime we think about judgment, we certainly have reason to fear, but for believers, there's no reason to fear. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The judgment that's talked about for the believer for his works are not talking about evil works. He's not being judged for sin. That's already been judged. That took place on the cross. Jesus took our sin in His own body on the cross. And our sin, therefore, was judged then. Now, what He's talking about here in verses 10 through 17 is He's talking about those works we do as believers. And He talks about what's behind the works. Because many times we see people do things and do things for the Lord, but we don't really know why they do what they're doing. Obviously, they can say, well, I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm doing this to serve the Lord. And that's a correct and right answer, but it's the Lord who will judge whether that was a true motive, whether they really were doing it for Him. And so there is a day coming. It's called the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, where believers will receive rewards or lose rewards. So let me take a moment and read this, beginning at verse 10. It says, According to the grace of God which was given to me like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. As I mentioned, the Bible talks about a judgment for believers' works. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it mentions the Bema seat. And as I said, the Bema seat was a place where athletes would receive rewards for winning the games. This was a place of rewards. We have it today when people win medals and gold and silver and bronze and they're at a place where they receive that. Even though everybody may be there, not everyone receives the prize, right? And that is true here. With the exception, we will all be there. And of course, the suffering loss is the same as an athlete. They just don't receive a reward. The same is true for believers. You either will receive a reward or not receive a reward, but you will not be lost. You can't be lost again. You're saved forever. 
And I know days we don't feel like we're saved. And I know sometimes we do or say some of the most off-the-wall things that should have never come out of our mouths, let alone the deeds that came from it. And we act like unbelievers sometimes. But the habit and the practice of our life is righteousness. The practice of our life is Jesus. And so as we look at this this morning, we're going to see that a believer will receive a reward for their service to Christ, but it will be based upon their motive for service. Now, as we said last time that we looked in this chapter, that he ended at verse 9 with saying that the Corinthians were God's building. And now in this section, verses 10 to 17, he's going to end by saying that they are God's temple. Now, you have to realize uh, the church still did not have its own place to meet. That didn't occur until much later. And so the imagery that he's using here would be of the temple. When he talks about the gold, the silver, the precious stones, this would have some reference to that. And plus the fact that he mentions temple of God in verse 16. He mentions temple of God again in verse 17. And this is all a unit of thought. Verses 10 to 17 is one unit of thought. He's covering one subject here. And so as we look at this, we're going to learn specifically about the work of preachers, the work of teachers, the work of believers that contribute to the building up of the church, which essentially is all of us. And then he's going to end in verses 16 and 17 with a warning. Even though he does mention a warning in the midst of this, like verse, verse 10, where he says at the bottom of it, each man must be careful how he builds. That's a warning. And so let's look at this. There are five things I want us to see in this text this morning, and they'll go pretty quick. The first is found in verses 10 and 11, where we read that Paul laid the foundation. He says there again, according to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I laid the foundation. That's the main verb in verse 10. He tells us that it was by the grace of God that he did this. By the way, that's how any of us serve God. It's by his grace. None of us are worthy to be here. None of us are worthy to serve. I'm certainly not worthy to stand up here and talk to you. I'm not worthy to be a pastor. I'm not worthy to lead songs about Christ. I'm not worthy of any of that. I'm not worthy to step foot on this property. I'm not worthy to be called a child of God. I'm not worthy of heaven. But what I am worthy of is hell. And so are you. But as we look at this, Paul points that out as well. He says that this grace was given to him. He uses the aorist tense, so it points to a historical moment uh, when this was given to him. It's passive, which means that he had to receive it. It wasn't something that he had to do to get it. You and I can't earn grace. Grace is a gift. It says in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved, and that not of yourself. It is what? A gift. A gift of God. But he did say over in 1 Corinthians 15, in verses 9 and 10, he says, I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen? And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And we do see people that labor very hard for the kingdom of God. And sometimes we tend to get a little human with this, and we say, look at all the work they are doing. Look at everything they are doing for the church, everything they are doing for the kingdom of God. But if they had the attitude that Paul had, and I suppose that many of them would, and they say that, it's by God's grace I am what I am. I may labor more than others, but it's His grace. His grace that is with me. And we all serve at different degrees and different levels, different capacities, with different energy. He says over in 1 Timothy 1.12 to Timothy, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. 
Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. And that is true for us as well. We acted ignorantly in unbelief. And God granted us mercy. And His grace was abundant to us. So we could say the same thing. And so he says, I laid a foundation, and again, referring back to when he first came to Corinth, and he came there preaching the Word of God. He says, I did all this by God's grace. And you know the Corinthians had the grace too. I mean, I pointed out that you and I have the grace too, but let's just be specific. Go back to chapter 1. And look at verse 4. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus. And how do we know that they had this grace? Well, they were enriched in all speech. They were enriched in all knowledge, according to verse 5. Verse 7, they didn't lack in any gift. They had all the gifts. All the gifts that are mentioned in chapter 12 were operating at that moment. And as I pointed out, I believe that there are some gifts that later ceased because they were temporary sign gifts. They had a specific purpose attached to them. And when that purpose was met, then they stopped. Like speaking in tongues. But that's not the only one. The sign gifts. But we'll talk about that when we get in chapter 12 in about a couple years. <laughs> but he says that he laid this foundation. He did it by the grace of God. And not only that, but he did it as a wise master builder. And the word wise can also mean skilled. And the word master builder comes from a Greek word where we get architect. But the idea of architect here is not just someone who draws the plans, but he was the type that drew the plans and did the work. He didn't have other contractors, if you will. He was doing all of that. Now he does mention in this letter that he has Sosthenes over in chapter 1 and verse 1. These men came into this city. They came to this church. Christ wasn't named there. They preached the gospel. One people to Christ and a church started. That's how churches start. You know that. But they had this grace too. And he came by the grace of God, laying this foundation as a wise master builder. He was skilled at what he was doing. And as I said, he not only drew the plans, but he built the building. He laid this foundation. And again, the idea of laying this foundation is referring back to this one time act of when he came to Corinth preaching the gospel. He did it the same way everywhere he went. If you were to start a church and you were to go to talk to people that are unchurched, people that are not saved, you would be laying a foundation. You wouldn't be building on another's foundation. Now, somebody else that comes in after a church has started, they're building on that foundation. All the believers there, they're building on that foundation. You and I are building this church with Christ. Obviously, the the Scriptures tell us in Matthew 16, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But we are also partners with Him in ministry. How do we build this church? Well, number one, you've got to be saved, right? Number two, you need to be Spirit-filled. Because when you're not Spirit-filled, what are you? What have we been talking about? You're in the flesh. You can't build anything but problems when you're in the flesh. You can't contribute to any good of the church if you're walking in the flesh. Because after a while, you're going to be tired of everything here. You're going to get tired of all the things that are being said. Maybe you get tired of being hugged on all the time. I don't know how anybody could be tired of that. But some people do. And if they're not in the Lord, they're not in the faith, they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then yes, they will get tired of that stuff and eventually leave. And if they don't eventually leave off of that, they may eventually leave off the teaching if the teachers and preachers of the Word are faithful to preach the whole counsel of God, then they will be confronted in the error that they're sitting in. They'll be confronted in their lostness. And you know, when we come to church, I mean, several things ought to take place. Yes, we ought to prepare ourselves for worship. We ought to prepare ourselves to worship the Lord by making sure in our heart that we don't have some kind of sin that we're harboring. But not only that, 
We need to make sure that we're using the gifts that God has given to us. That is how we contribute. Let me have you to take your Bible for just a moment. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, notice in Ephesians chapter 4, when you look at that, you're going to see something that Paul says in verse 11 where he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers or pastor teachers. And he says, why? Why did God give these gifted men to the church? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ. And how long is this to take place? Verse 13, till we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to Christ. And as we're doing this, we're being built up, we're being matured by the teaching of the pastor teacher, then something else is going to happen. Verse 14, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. We're not going to be carried away by everything that's being taught. We're going to evaluate it. We're going to examine it. And not only that, but we're going to speak the truth, verse 15, in love. And we're going to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. But I want you to notice verse 16. It says, From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part. Now remember, he's using body language. Body parts. You know what happens when one part of your body stops working? It affects the other parts, right? Well, you know what happens when people in the church stop serving? It affects the rest of the church. When you don't use your spiritual gifts, it affects the church. And he's saying here, when everyone is doing their own part, their proper part, working each individual part, what's going to happen? Look at the end of the verse. It causes what? Growth. Growth of the body. For the building up of itself in love. I mean, we think that growing the church is just running out and getting people to come in here, and we've got more people in here occupying the pews, and therefore we're growing. But you could have a whole full church of seats that are not empty and be spiritually immature. You've got to grow in the Word. Each individual person has to grow in the Word. Each individual person has to hear what the pastor teacher is teaching, what the teachers are teaching, and apply it. Live it. Do it. Let this permeate your life. And when Paul came to Corinth, when he came to other churches that God used him to start, he laid down this foundation. And if you'll notice since you're in Ephesians, go back to chapter 2 and notice similar terminology that he's using in chapter 2 that he used also in 1 Corinthians 3. Look over at verse 19. Ephesians 2.19, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints in our God's, what? Household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief, or being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fit together and is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now look at that again. He's saying that they were God's household, they were built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus is that cornerstone. He's the reason the whole building is fit together. He's the whole reason why it's growing into a holy temple in the Lord. He's the whole reason why we're being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So Paul lays this foundation. And again, he uses this terminology to speak of a builder. Nathan loves building. He loves building things. He loves watching people build things. I remember some of the stuff that we did to our home a couple years ago, and uh, we had some people out there doing some stuff, and I said, Nathan, I'm surprised you're not out there right this second, because normally he'd be out there, you know, observing all this stuff and right under him. But he's told me over and over that's what he loves. It's what he would like to do one day is to build things. I said, well, good, because you're going to have to take care of me later, so you make sure the job that you pick is going to provide enough to take care of you and me. <laughs> but think about this. In the 18 months that Paul was at Corinth, he faithfully preached, faithfully taught the gospel. That's all he did. And again, that's how churches start. You preach the gospel. This whole idea to think 
that we're going to grow without any evangelism is foreign from the Bible. So if we want to see more seats taken in here, we need to be committed to evangelism. Quit trying to go and build on someone else's foundation. Quit trying to go and get someone from another church and bring them here. Bring someone here who is not churched. Bring someone here who doesn't go to church. Someone who doesn't even know Jesus. Bring them. Evangelize them. Talk to them about Jesus. That's exactly what Paul did. He carefully and skillfully laid the right foundation. He had the right motive. He had the right message. He had the right power. He had the right approach. He was a master strategist. Because what he did, he was an apostle to the Gentiles. But in order to reach the Gentiles, he knew he needed to reach the Jews first. So when he would go into a city, he would go to the synagogue in hopes of reaching the Jews who in turn would help him to evangelize the Gentiles. But you know as well as I do, the Jews did not want anything to do with Gentiles. Right? Let alone anything to do with Samaritans. They didn't want that Samaritan dust on them. They didn't want Gentile dirt on them. They didn't have anything to do with it. They were very hypocritical, very judgmental. Just like you read of the religious leaders, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, the Jewish leaders. Very, very hypocritical. Paul knew, though, that the Jews, if he won them to Christ, then they would help him. And many that he did win to Christ did exactly that. But those who did not come to Christ wanted to destroy everything he was doing and wanted to kill him. Just like they wanted to kill Jesus, they wanted to kill him. And you might have that happen to you. Someone hate you so much with this message of the gospel that they would want to kill you. You say, that, that'll never happen. Oh yeah? Then you don't understand what's coming. Because in this world in which we live, this world will continue to get worse and worse, more hostile to Christ, more hostile to Israel. You're already hearing that, I think it's Elizabeth Warren says if she's elected president, she will stop funding Israel. Israel is our neighbor. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. They have our interest at hand, and we have their interest at hand. But you know, the Bible specifically says that if you mess with Israel, it's like sticking your finger in his eye. What happens when you get your finger stuck in, a finger stuck in your eye? It irritates you, doesn't it? And uh, God will take care of Israel, and God will bless those who bless Israel. The reason why we've been a blessed nation is because we've always looked after Israel. We've always supported them. And so again, Paul knew that if he went to the synagogue and he reasoned with them, from the Old Testament Scriptures about Jesus being the suffering servant, the Messiah who had to die and rose again the third day, then he would have help. That's exactly what the Jews were to be, evangelists. But you know as well as I do that they did not seek to help him. And finally he stopped going specifically to the Jews and he turned and went specifically to the Gentiles. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 13, as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. So he was careful. And he diligently planned. He laid a solid foundation. The footings were very deep. And they would last. If you build on anything else, they will not last. They will come falling down like a house of cards. And foundation is very important. Over in Matthew chapter 7. Let me have you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus tells us about two types of people. Those who hear the Word and do it, and those who hear the Word and don't do it. And He likens them to a man who built his house on sand and a man who built his house on a rock. Look at what He says. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. 
Everyone who hears the, these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. What are the words that he's talking about that they're hearing? Well, what did he just say in verses 21 through 23? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, remember I told you when we were in 1 Peter 2, 1, and there was a therefore there? You have to ask the question, what's the therefore therefore? Why is it there? What's he saying? Well, he's picking up something he's already said. And he's tying it into the present. There are people that run around and call Jesus Lord, and they confess him as their Lord, but they practice lawlessness. They practice sin. And Jesus is saying they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. They are those who practice lawlessness. They're not those who practice righteousness. That's why I say this all the time. Please examine yourself. Please examine yourself. Make sure that you really are a Christian. That you really are saved. Go to the Scripture and let the Scripture point that out to you. Say, so how do I do that? Well, simply go to passages like I just read. Go to... 1 John. 1 John is a good book on dealing with absolutes, whether you really are for Christ or you're not for Christ. Whether you love your brother or whether you hate your brother. Whether you practice righteousness or you practice sin. Over and over he gives test after test. You can go to the book of James. He gives tests there. How do you handle your trials in James chapter 1? Do you crumble when you go through trouble in your life? Are you always falling into temptation? Are you impartial or partial to people? You have people come in, you look at them strangely, and you kind of measure them up against yourself. You say, well, I'm better than them. And then you begin to treat them like that. It's like James said. A man comes into church. He's got all these nice clothes on. He has all these rings on his finger. Seems to indicate he has some money. What do people do when they find out people have money? They gravitate toward them, right? It's like the people that win the lottery. They have no friends. They have friends now. Right? Till that money's gone. And then they're back to no friends again. Again, Paul came into a city. He laid a foundation. And he also points out, if you go back to 1 Corinthians 3, that there are others who build on the foundation. He says that in verse 10. According to the grace of God which was given to me like a skilled Master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. That is referring to people who come after him. Paul began the church at Ephesus, but who pastored after Paul? Timothy. So he's building on the foundation that Paul laid down. We've been building on foundations here for almost 71 years. Next week is our 71st anniversary. That's crazy, isn't it? And in many cases, we're going back and seeing what that foundation looked like and making sure that the walls that have been erected have been built on a proper foundation. All new churches lay a foundation. I was involved in church planning for a good amount of years, and all churches start with nothing. Nothing. I remember when we met in a school, and I used to have a little statement I'd say, well, we can't say the church is the building or the church is stained glass windows because there's none of that here. In fact, what we found out was we should have been meeting in a high school because in an elementary school, what were we sitting on? Little tiny chairs that were about that tall. So we had to bring chairs. All churches lay a foundation. Others build on that foundation. How we build is critical. Very critical how we build. And that gets into the quality of your work. That gets into your motive. Why are you here this morning? Why'd you come today? What's your motive for being here? Don't answer me out loud, please. <laughs> but that's questions you need to ask. Some do it just out of routine. 
This is what I do. Every Sunday, a certain amount of time, I get up. Or maybe Saturday night, I lay out my clothes. And then Sunday morning, I get up. I put on those clothes. I have a certain time to, to eat, a certain time to leave. And I come. It's just what I do. And I could say the same thing. Being your pastor, I get up, I come. And I'm here early. And people find out that I'm here early and they come join me. <laughs> and then I put them to work. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know what attention that person's bringing to himself. but Paul did not want to build on another's foundation. He wanted to lay the foundation himself. Because he didn't know if they built in error. You thought about that? In Romans 15, 20, he said, And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so that I would not build on another man's foundation. There's many cases and places that he went, and the people that opposed him could not accept the gospel that he preached because it was not a gospel of works, it was a gospel of faith. And they couldn't get that. They could not understand that. And you know as well as I do that Working your way to heaven will not get you in heaven. Working your way to heaven will get you in hell. You can't work your way to heaven. It's a gift. And a glorious gift, isn't it? He wanted to preach where Christ wasn't named. Have you ever went to places where Christ wasn't named? Where people didn't talk about Jesus? Sure we have. We've been in a lot of those places. And it's becoming more today. Especially with the younger generation growing up. What we call the millennials. They're being brainwashed in school. They're being brainwashed in college because many of them are run by liberals that turn their hearts against things that are sound, things that are true. But you know, it happens the same way in Christian colleges. There are many Christian colleges that are liberal, that do not believe the Bible, word for word. They're like one who had the Jefferson Bible that wanted to come along and cut out things that they didn't agree with or the Bible that the Jehovah's Witnesses used the New World Translation they come along and take out all the references to hell and if you don't have any references to hell in the Bible then it obviously doesn't exist that's not true if you're holding a Bible that's in error right Paul wanted to make sure others were building on the right foundation and what is that foundation look at verse 11 for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is that foundation. And you know what? He establishes the foundation. He lays it out. And he did that when he came. When he began his ministry, Mark 1, 14 and 15 says that he began in Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So he came with a gospel of repentance, a gospel of faith. He also talked about wrath, judgment. He talked about that in Acts 17, 30, and 31. Truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but he is now commanding all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world through this man, Jesus. See, when Jesus came the first time, he came as a baby in a manger. He came for the purpose of dying for his people's sin. When he comes back the second time, he's not coming back as one who would die for people. He didn't need to do it again. Hebrews chapter 1, his death was perfect, never to be repeated. It accomplished exactly what he came to accomplish. He said in John 19, 30, it is finished to tell us die, and exactly that occurred. Redemption was accomplished. When he comes back the second time, he's coming back as a judge. He will take out vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not know our Lord Jesus Christ. Read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. So he established the foundation, preaching the gospel, calling for repentance, calling for faith. Sometimes when we offer the gospel to people, we, we offer it like it's take it or leave it. We offer it like it's optional. But we should be offering it as what it is. The only way to God. A lot of religions out there, a lot of types of churches, a lot of denominations, one way to heaven. And not everybody talking about heaven is going to heaven. 
Not everybody preaching about heaven is going to heaven. The church says that they're focused on heaven are like some of these new churches that open up their service with an ACDC song, Highway to Hell. Yes, I heard about that. Church opened its service singing Highway to Hell. ACDC. After Jesus' resurrection, he told his disciples in Luke 24, 44, These are my words which I spoke to you, which while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, in the prophets, in the Psalms. By the way, that's the three divisions of the Hebrew Old Testament. Speaking of all the Bible, he said, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So what is he saying here? He's saying the same again. Jesus had to suffer and rise again on the third day. And He calls for repentance. Calls for this gospel to be proclaimed. The foundation is Jesus. Think about this. What do we learn in Scripture about Jesus? We learn about His virgin birth. We learn about His perfect life. Sinless life. Righteous life. We learn about His crucifixion. And we learn about His resurrection. Jesus is God. No man can do what He did. No man can say what He said if He wasn't God. And this is the foundation that Paul laid. He preached the gospel of a crucified, risen Christ. you remember in chapter 1 and verse 23, he says, We preach Christ crucified. And he said it again in chapter 2 and verse 2 about preaching Christ crucified. That's the gospel. Chapter 15, he'll get into it again. Of the elements of the gospel. But he's talking about the very foundation that he laid as he began the church at Corinth. The foundational message that Jesus preached is that foundation, foundational message that we are to preach. Anything less than that is false teaching. Notice the materials that he used. Look at verse 12. He lists two types of materials that believers build on the foundation of Christ. Both are of different quality. One is perishable. The other one is not. One withstands the fire. The other one burns up. And anything that is not of the quality of the wisdom of God would be considered wood, hay, and straw. And it's going to be consumed in the final judgment. As long as we are alive as believers... We are building the church. Believers are building some sort of life, some sort of church, some sort of Christian fellowship, some sort of service. It may be a beautiful structure, it may be a shack. It may be by intention or by neglect, but it cannot help being something. So he says in verse 12, If any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. So the first three would be considered superior materials. Gold, silver, precious stones. Precious stones probably uh, does not refer to like diamonds or rubies or other gems, but probably refers to the granite, the marble, the alabaster that was used in the construction of the costly temples. These materials actually would represent, get this, Faithful ministry. Being faithful. Serving with the right motive. Loving Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Being Spirit-filled. Serving each other for their benefit, not yours. So these represent right motives for service in building the church. The second list of materials would be inferior materials, wood, hay, and straw, and they would represent shallow activity with no eternal value. These are those that would burn up at the test of fire. They're inferior. They're not evil. Can't say he's talking about evil here because all of our evil was judged on the cross. But he's talking about 
Again, those things that you and I may do that have no eternal value whatsoever. No eternal value. They represent wrong motives. Listen to what James says in James chapter 4 in verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. When you pray for things, why do you pray for what you pray for? Is this for your own pleasure? Yeah, we want nice creature comforts. I would love not to have pain in my feet. But I have it. And I have days it hurts worse than others. I have days it doesn't bother me at all. Right now it's not bothering me. But I'd love to have that removed. I promise every day God would remove that. And He's chosen not to. It's like in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul had this thorn in the flesh, he prayed three times to God to remove it, and what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. So he started boasting in his weaknesses then. And that's what we should do. We don't boast in our weaknesses. We don't boast in our illnesses. We complain about them. Don't we? God forbid you ask anybody how they are doing, and they honestly answer you. Right? Right? Just adopt what D. James Kennedy used to say when people would ask him, how are you doing? He would always say, better than I deserve. And use that as your response. Better than I deserve. You don't need to be like the neighbor I told you about that lived across the street when I was growing up and we'd go over there and buy candy because they would sell candy to all the kids in the neighborhood and we'd go up there and you never said, how are you doing, Miss Morley? And she would tell you. For 10 or 15 minutes, you're standing there, a little 10-year-old, hearing all of this. The last thing on the world, you don't care about that. Just let me get my candy. Let me go eat it. Let me have this sugar rush for about an hour. And then I'll come back for more. Right? Unless mom has cooked some cookies. Look at verse 13. He mentions the superior and the inferior materials. But then he says that each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And this day that he's referring to is talking about the Bema Seat. The Bema Seat, where athletes would receive rewards. What it would mean is if you served Christ in any capacity without the right motives, then you wouldn't receive a reward. Now, I, I'm with you. Being in heaven is enough reward. But wouldn't you want to have your Father's pleasure all the time? Wouldn't you want Him to be pleased with you all the time and not disappointed? I mean, I'd love that with my kids, my grandkids, that I'm always pleased at every decision they make, every word that comes out of their mouth, every way that they treat their brother and sisters. I would love to be a father that could look at my kids and see them treating each other perfectly. But that ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen in this life. You know, we're always putting out fires. Even when they're sick, they still fight with each other. But each man's work will become evident. It's going to become evident what kind of materials that you used. It's not a combination of materials. It's not saying on one project you use wood, and then you use hay, and then you use straw. No, it's using... The idea that you built on wood. You built on precious stones. See, I mean, going back to Matthew 7, with the one who hears the word and does it, he built his house on a rock, right? He was on the precious stone, so he had the right foundation. No matter what storms in this life would come, it's not going to knock that house down. What's going to knock you down? What storm in your life will knock you down? knock you out. Well, we can think of some pretty horrible things, can't we? What's, what's one of the worst horrible things that we can think of? Death of a loved one, right? Maybe a second thing would be either watching a loved one suffer 
or you're suffering really bad, you know, pain has a way to... I mean, it's a good and a bad thing. There are people out there that can't feel pain, and that's why they're burning themselves and they're cutting themselves. And You know, I have neuropathy in my feet, which means I have a lot of numbness in my feet. And sometimes when I come in after being out during the day and I look down and my foot's been bleeding and I didn't even know it. Never knew it. And my wife will say the same thing. What'd you do this time? Of which I would reply, I have no idea. I don't know what I did. So I'll go put some shoes on. <laughs> I like to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and wear flip-flops, okay? Jesus didn't wear flip-flops. He wore sandals. So I wear a modern-day version of of, flip, uh, of sandals or flip-flops. So each man's work is going to become evident. What kind of material did you use in your life to build on that foundation? Was it Christ and Christ only? He says there, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter talks about this, and he talks about fire. He says in 1 7, actually, let me just back up. He says in verse 6, In this you greatly rejoice, and that is, you're rejoicing that you're protected by the power of God, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being much more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is subject to be tested. You say you have faith. James says, show it to me. Let me see it. You know, it's hard to show faith without works. Deeds. And that's where James goes with it. James says if you have true saving faith, it'll be seen in your life. It'll be seen how you lived. It'll be seen in your deeds. It'll be seen in your work. These things don't save you, but they are the outcome. They are the result of true, genuine, saving faith. So, God's going to test the quality of each man's work. Verse 14, if any man's work which he has built on remains... He will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. This is not talking about someone losing their salvation. Once saved, always saved. Yes, I believe that. Some, some people believe it's actually a Bible verse. It's not, but it is a truth taught in Scripture. And people have trouble with that. And they don't, some don't believe in eternal security that you're saved forever. And I don't even go there. I go back to the very beginning of it, and let's, say, let's determine whether you really are saved. Some people equate salvation with walking an aisle. And they say, I walked an aisle years and years ago. I gave my life to Jesus. I prayed this certain prayer. I even got baptized. But they're still lost. How do you know that? You go back to Matthew 7. They practice sin. They practice sin. Practice is something you do over and over and over. Our boys are playing soccer right now. We arrive an hour early before they play the game and they practice for an hour. Doing the same drills over and over. I was in athletics. We would do some of the things over and over and over till you had it. You, when I play music, I go through these songs that I pick out for Sunday. I play them. I practice them. That's going over something over and over and over. Well, you know what? You can do the same thing with sin in your life. If you're one who has trouble with anger, and you get angry all the time at everything, then you're practicing unrighteous anger, which is sin. You see? And if people looked at you and knew you, and they said, well, that person's an angry person. I don't want to be around that person. What would you do to your testimony of Christ? What would you do to the testimony of the church? Because if you're that kind of person and you start talking about Jesus to them and then you start talking about the church you go to, they're probably thinking, I'm not going to that church. I'll never step foot in that church. Why? Look at this person who represents that church. They're angry all the time. 
Or what if you ran into somebody else with some other sin? You, you would be saying the same thing. Now, he concludes this in verses 16 and 17 with a warning. A severe warning to any who would try to interfere with or destroy the building of the church on the foundation of Christ. He starts with a question, verse 16. Look at that. He says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is true of each individual believer. This is true of the church. And he, I believe he's talking collectively to the church. And he's using you in that perspective. And he's saying to the church, don't you know that you are a temple of God? And in a temple of God, who dwells there? God. The Spirit of God. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus walks in the midst of His church. Revelation 2.1 He's the one who holds the seven stars in His right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. We also know the Scripture says that He indwells every believer in every church. If you truly are a believer, then He indwells you. Let me just share one passage with you as we bring this to a close. It's found in John 14 and verse 16. Jesus is speaking to His disciples. He's telling them that He's about to go. You were sitting here in Sunday school. We went through chapter 14. He says, I will ask the Father and He will give you another Helper that He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see Him or know Him. But you know Him because He abides with you and will future be in you. It was future for them. Instant for us. Instant for anyone after Jesus gave the Spirit and left. So He indwells every believer. If you're a believer here this morning, you have the Holy Spirit in you. If you say, I don't have the Spirit, I need to pray and seek the Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 9, if you don't have the Spirit, you're not Christ, you don't belong to Christ. So if you're a Christian, you have the Spirit of God. He indwells you. He lives in you. The question is, are you obeying Him? Are you walking by the Spirit as we've been talking about? Notice also the warning that He gives. As He says in verse 17, If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Contributing to a church being unholy is dangerous. That's why it's dangerous if a church doesn't practice church discipline, confronting erring members in the church who are consistently sinning. If you don't confront it, it's going to be that leaven that leavens the whole lump. It's going to be that leaven that will permeate the entire church, and the entire church will be in your sin. I'm not saying confronting it. They'll be guilty of it. Because they're not confronting it. So just ask yourself a few questions. What are you building your life on? Are you building your life on Christ? Are you loving Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you loving your neighbor as yourself? Are you building the church in the right way, with the right attitudes, with the right motives? Are you using your spiritual gifts? You say, well, I don't know what my spiritual gifts are. Do you even know what they are? As they're found in Romans 12. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, did you even know they occurred in those three passages? Go through the list. If you're not sure what your gift is, go through the list. And see what you have a desire for. Meaning, what is the way that you want to serve Jesus? What is the consuming desire of your heart in the way you want to serve Him? The consuming passion of my life when I realized that God was calling me to preach was just simply that. Preaching His Word. That was the passion. Uh, maturing believers in the fellowship through the preaching of the Word. Also a passion. That's what drives me. That's what holds me accountable as well. Knowing that I have to stand here and preach the Word. And I can't stand here if I'm full of sin and giving in to sin over and over and to stand up here and try to tell you not to do that. That's a hypocrite for sure, right? Right? And I do believe if you, if you blow it and you mess up, you need to go to the person you blew it and messed up to. And if it covers two, three, or four people or more, tell everybody who witnessed it. 
We need to make sure we're building in the right way, with the right attitudes, with the right motive. If you built on wood, hay, and straw, it will not last through the test of fire. It will burn up, and you will not receive a reward, even though you're still saved. But wouldn't you like to have a reward for service to Christ so that you can cast that at His feet and worship to Him? I would. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, and this is how we know he's talking about motives here. He says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. If you have the right motives, you will hear God say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Right? The Apostle John, 2 John 1.8, he said, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. You want to receive a full reward. Again, as you serve Jesus. Some people think it's wrong to serve for rewards, but you know what? People that get out there and compete in games, they do it for rewards. You take the reward away, you've taken away the purpose. When I was coaching t-ball when my first three kids were small, they had to take away scoring. They didn't keep score because the parents couldn't handle it because they acted like jerks out there yelling at everybody and yelling at the coaches, yelling at the umpires. So they took the scoring away and they told everybody, of both teams, you both won. I don't agree with that. I didn't agree with it then. You didn't teach them about competition. You didn't teach them about how to be a good loser as well as a good winner. You teach them any of those things. And people need to know that. They need to know about disappointment and how to handle it, right? Get them next time. Try harder. Work harder. We are the temple of God. The Spirit of God dwells in us. We need to be careful how we're building this church. We want to make sure that we are doing it with superior materials. Gold, silver, precious stones. Not inferior materials, wood, hay, and straw. We want it to stand the test of fire. Amen? Well, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know Him right now. Jesus said, repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, confess Jesus as Lord. He says that in Romans 10, 9 and 10 as well. You confess Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead and you shall be saved. But you've got to call upon the name of the Lord. So the Lord is doing that in you. Praise His name that He has His hand on your life. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time we've had together. We thank you for your word. We pray now as we bring everything to a conclusion that this would be on our minds and our hearts throughout this day, Father, that we would examine our lives, that we would watch ourselves, that we do not lose what we have accomplished, but that we may receive a full reward. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.